How's everybody doing today? We're good at that. Everybody's ready? Uh, oh. Okay. Um, we covered a lot of material yesterday. A lot of, a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of cool stuff about hemoglobin, myoglobin. Um, I want to finish up talking about protein structure uh, very briefly at the beginning, and then we're going to talk about protein isolation, uh, separation, purification. Uh, but uh, in doing that, um, I want to uh, try to paint the picture for you that there's um, an awful lot to this. Okay? So you've seen, if you look at a globular protein, for example, that the globular protein has a specific structure. And I've told you that if we destroy that specific structure, we lose the function of that globular protein. Okay? Um, and it's fairly easy to lose that structure. Okay? One of the things that we don't know as much as we would like to is how that structure gets there in the first place. Okay? So the process by which this occurs we refer to as folding. Okay? Folding. So folding is the process that gives that ultimate structure. And somebody asked me after class um, uh, yesterday uh, about, well, why is it that if we denature a protein, why doesn't it just come back to the regular folded shape? We don't fully know the answer to that question, but it probably has to do with the fact that proteins are made one amino acid at a time. And so as it's sequentially going through, it's already starting the folding process as it's being made. Okay? So there are things that don't exist in the protein once it's already started. So that, for example, the carboxy terminus won't be done when it starts folding. That carboxy terminus might get in the way of it in the process of folding. Okay, So if we take a protein and we completely denature it, we, heat, we boil it or something, and we take it all apart, that carboxy terminus, for example, is there. And it may very well interfere with, with the folding process. There's many other things that might interfere that are in that sequence that aren't there when it starts. So it's probably having to do with that. What I want to say a little bit about, uh, about folding, I want to talk about two things. One is what I skipped over yesterday, which had to do with uh, denaturation and renaturation. And then I want to talk about uh, what we know about folding um, to, uh, so far. Okay? So I've mentioned this protein very briefly, this enzyme very briefly. It's called RNase. And RNase is a really interesting enzyme. Uh, its name uh, tells us, first of all, that whenever you see the letters ASE on the end of a, of a, a molecule name, it means it's an enzyme. So RNase means it, that it acts on RNA. And, it, and specifically what RNA does is it breaks down RNA. Breaks it down. Okay? Um, RNA is interesting not just for that, though. RNA is interesting because it turns out to be a very stable protein. We can, take, we can boil this protein, and unlike most other proteins, it will refold back into its original shape. Because it? It will refold back into its original shape. Most proteins won't do that. Okay? But RNase will do that. You might start thinking, well, why does RNase do it and other proteins don't do that? And we don't fully know the answer to that. But one very uh, important thing that we think about is right here. All right? This has some disulfide bonds. And most proteins have disulfide bonds. But we're thinking that these disulfide bonds are pretty in pretty critical places such that they hold the protein in a specific configuration. And boiling it won't destroy disulfide bonds because there's not enough energy in boiling to do that. So even though we may disrupt some of the structures in there, by holding these pieces together, this guy is able to self-assemble. It goes back and refolds properly. Okay? Other proteins that have disulfide bonds probably don't have those in the critical places necessary to help hold that structure together. If we fully want to denature ribonuclease, we not only have to boil it, but we also have to treat it with some chemicals that will break those disulfide bonds. Okay? We have to completely break those disulfide bonds. So when we do that, we use chemicals called, um, uh, that specifically we use beta mercaptoethanol. Mercaptoethanol is a chemical 
that will convert a disulfide bond into a sulfhydro bond. So you see the sulfhydro bonds over here. Okay. And the urea is there. Urea has the effect kind of like heat does. Urea will disrupt hydrogen bonds. Okay. So the combination of urea, which is the equivalent of heating it, plus mercaptoethanol will cause ribonuclease to completely denature. And when we do that, we can then have this uh, enzyme in an inactive form. Okay? If we don't do that, we find that it, that it actually works pretty darn well all by itself. Now, what this tells us is that sequence of amino acids determines the folding. Sequence determines it. Because once we boil it, all right, there's no other thing that we've got in that mixture. All we have is the protein itself. The sequence of amino acids is, is causing it to refold back into the proper configuration. Okay? So refolding happens. We know that the sequence of amino acids is critical. We know that the sequence of amino acids gives the, the protein its structure, gives the protein all of its properties. And we also know that the sequence of the amino acids ultimately causes the folding process to occur. Okay, now that's one thing I want to tell you. I'm going to tell you something kind of surprising, okay? We sure would like to be able to predict what the folded structure of a protein is, all right? We would like to be able to predict the folded structure of a protein. And it turns out when people first, in, when people started, first started working with computers, they said, oh, this is a fairly trivial problem. We know the dimensions of the amino acids. We know the structures that they have. We give it to a computer. We tell let the computer cogitate on it a while. And soon enough, we should be able to have the computer go through all the different possibilities and find out ultimately what the folded structure is. And then we'll know. And that, be, having folded structure information is really important because we would like to be able to design drugs. And if we know the exact structure, then we can actually design the drugs that will stop, knock out this enzyme or this protein that we're, we're interested in. Well, it turned out to be not so simple. Okay? Back in the 60s when they first started doing that, they thought it would be fairly trivial. And we are, we are now in the 2010s, and we still don't have the answer to this question. Somebody sat down a few years ago and said, well, how big of a problem is it? If we wanted to determine all the possible structures that we could have in a protein, how feasible is it for me to use computing power to do it? So they made some estimates based on a relatively short polypeptide, 50 amino acids, 50 amino acids. And they said, OK, here's the various rotational angles that we can have. Here's all the various things that can be inside of this protein of only 50 amino acids. Okay? And they did some calculations about all the different possible angles and all the different things that could happen within that protein. Because they said, well, if we consider every possible one, then that means we've considered the random process that a protein might go through in the folding process. If it's a random process, it's going to go through all these and ultimately end up with the right one. Okay. Well, when they did the calculations, they were absolutely astonished at what they came up with. Okay. Astonished at what they came up with. What they determined was if a, pr if a protein was going through a random process, like a computer would go through in determining its structure, okay. if you took a computer the most powerful computer on earth, okay? And you had not only that computer, but every computer on the face of the earth was as powerful as the most powerful computer on the face of the earth, okay? And you started them working on the problem of, 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 of predicting the structure for this one 50 amino acid polypeptide, it would take a million times longer than the age of the universe to solve the problem. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a pretty big problem, okay? So it means that, first of all, that folding is not a random process. We may not fully understand that process, but it doesn't go through all possible random things and finally settle at the right one. It probably goes through some pathways that lead one pathway leads to another pathway, leads to another pathway, leads to another pathway, ultimately results in a folded structure. And perhaps what's happening when we denature a protein is we disrupt the sequence of those pathways that happen that give rise to a structure. We haven't solved the problem, 
but it means that we're not going to solve it by looking at it by a random process because there's too many possible ways in which this thing could fold um, randomly that we'll never be able to solve. Okay, so that's what this is sort of trying to show you, the sort of stepwise process that uh, a computer would go through in trying to predict the protein, uh, the structure of a protein. Okay. Folding of a protein is very important because, as I said, if it doesn't fold, all right, then we don't get any activity. Well, it turns out that there's, there's an even bigger problem that happens sometimes, and that is, what if a protein folds the wrong way? What if a protein folds the wrong way? I'm sorry? Well, will not function, all right? Yes, that would be, that would be good if, they, if that were the only thing that happened to it, but it's not. So there are some proteins that when they misfold cause some very, very uh, dire consequences. Okay? So many proteins when they misfold probably don't do anything. It doesn't function. All right? But there's a protein that you have in your brain that when it misfolds causes a very serious disease. Okay? You've heard about it in cows called mad cow disease. Mad cow disease arises as a result of a protein that misfolds. Now, why does a misfolding of a protein cause a disease like mad cow? How can that happen? Well, it's kind of a bizarre thing. When they first started studying mad cow, they had no idea how this mad cow disease was being transmitted from one cow to the next because it looked like it was infectious. It looked like it had a virus. They looked for viruses and they looked for viruses and they looked for viruses and they couldn't find anything. But they kept finding these things they called amyloid plaques in the brains of these um, mad cows. These plaques were growing and they were actually destroying nerve function in the brain. That's why the cows go mad. That's why they uh, ultimately die is their, their brain ceases to function. There's diseases that are similar to mad cow in almost every vertebrate organism. Okay? Sheep have a disease called scrapie. You don't need to know this. Humans have a disease called Creutzfeldt-Jakob, and I'm not going to spell that for you because you don't have to know that. All right? But all these diseases are very similar. Okay? Very similar diseases. And they happen because of misfolding of this protein. Well, they determined it wasn't a virus, it wasn't a bacterium. It was this protein that's a protein that you have in your brain. And it was misfolding. And when it didn't fold properly, this was the catcher, it turned out that what it was doing was it was causing other copies of the same protein to also misfold. That's how it kept growing and growing. Okay? It was making these long strings of things that were destroying nerve tissue in the brain. Okay? When people come down with Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome, okay, they don't last very long. They die fairly quickly because their brain just completely goes. There's not a cure for it. We don't know completely how it's transmitted. We still don't understand how it's transmitted. But there was some evidence back in England in the late 1980s where they weren't screening carefully the mad cows that were making it into the food supply. Okay? Mad ca cattle are supposed to be you know, inspected and so forth before they're slaughtered and uh, make sure that only healthy cattle are, in fact, being used. If you have sick cattle, you don't want them in your food supply. They weren't being very careful about this, and they had mad cows in their food supply. All right? What they discovered was, a few years later, the incidence of an unusual form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob in humans went way up. Okay? So you're thinking, it's not completely understood, and it's not known if, in fact, that you can get it in your diet. Some people argue that you can't, okay? But it may be that you can actually get this in your diet, and as a consequence, ultimately come down with the uh, syndrome. If your solution to this is to say, well, I should cook my meat well, okay, I've got news for you. It doesn't work that way. Not only does this mad cow protein misfold, it becomes extraordinarily stable once it's misfolded. Okay? Unfolding of the mad cow protein, that is to denature the mad cow protein, takes temperatures of over 700 degrees. Okay? You're not going to get that in cooking unless you burn your meat. And burning your meat has other problems. Okay, so um, 
So folding is very important. Folding properly is important. And what I have on the screen for you um, is another illustration of folding. Cells have placed such importance on proper folding that they have structures within them that help proteins to fold properly. They help proteins to fold properly. Okay? One of these, uh, or the, the, this class of, of structures that we have inside of cells are called chaperonins. C-H-A-P-E-R-O-N-I-N-S. Chaperonins. Like a chaperone. Did any of you go on a date when you were like young and you had a mom and dad as a chaperone or something? Well, chaperones go along to make sure there's, everything goes, turns out right, right? Okay. So chaperones make sure in the case of proteins that they fold properly. Okay. Well, what, when might a protein not fold properly? Okay. Well, let's imagine, for example, you have a fever. What is a fever? A fever is an elevated body temperature. And what have I been telling you breaks hydrogen bonds? Temperature. Might a fever break hydrogen bonds? Well, it would probably be very marginal if it did, but you might find some proteins that might be much more susceptible to it than others. It turns out that chaperones, the proteins that go together to make up a chaperone, and they're actually proteins that make this structure, the proteins that make this structure are induced to be made when the temperature goes up. They're called heat shock proteins. Kind of a cool thing. If we have or we are exposed to a higher temperature, a temperature where we might be more likely to have problems with folding, the heat shock proteins are made to ensure that folding occurs properly. That's kind of cool. Okay. So chaperonins are very important in this process. They do other things besides that, but that's one for which they're known. And I will tell you that chaperonins are so important that we see them across the spectrum of biology. That is, we see them in virtually every organism. Okay. This, um, actually, that's the, wrong, that's the wrong link there, isn't it? Okay. This is showing about the uh, thalassemias and, 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 and so forth. The mad cow proteins are called prions, by the way. I should, I should have said that, okay? A prion is a protein that's involved in mad cow disease. It was originally described as an infectious protein because of the way that it seemed to spread, okay? But um, it's not truly a virus or a bacterium. It is a, a protein that's normal in your own brain. Okay, um, that's where I'm going to stop talking about structure, uh, unless there's any questions that you guys have. Yeah? Did you say where the mad cows got that? Where they got it? Yeah. yeah, we don't know where they get it. So they can, uh, w when we see a mad cow, it's not uncommon we'll see others, so they can be transmitted from organism to another. We don't fully understand how that process happens, uh, but how the first one gets it, some random misfolding, probably. So there, there is a random element to life and probably now a random element to death uh, as well, unfortunately. Yes? Okay, so do prions cause other pro proteins to fold because of cooperativity? The answer is basically no. Okay? So um, they uh, probably have a structure that when the other one bumps into it, they, adopt the, is, they cause a sort of a flip in the structure that's happening. Cooperativity would happen if we had multiple subunits and then we had multiple things binding, and that, that's not what's happening. It's not a catalytic process as such. Yes? Is chaperones all of Chaperones are all proteins, uh huh? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, I have another song. I thought we would do the song now. It's actually reiterating things we learned yesterday. So I have two songs about hemoglobin, so I thought we would do it, the other one um, today. And. This is to the tune of an old song. You guys are probably way too young to know this. The old Coca-Cola song from the 1970s. Da 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 You guys know that song? Well, then you'll sing it anyway. Okay. All right. So let us sing. It's called The Bloody Things. I'm going to put some oxygens beside my poor friend Rings. To nudge the irons up a notch and yank on histidines. The globin shapes will change a bit 
Oh, what a sight to see the way they bind to oxygen cooperatively. And as I exit from the lungs to swim in the bloodstream, metabolizing cells, they all express their needs to me. To them I give up oxygen and change from R to T. While my amines, they hang on to the protons readily. But that's not all the tricks I know. There's more that's up my sleeve. Like gaps between subunits that hold two, three BPG. When near metabolizing cells, I bind things that diffuse. The protons and bicarbonates from lowly CO2s. That's the way it is when your cells are at play. Go say hip, hip, hooray for the bloody things. Okay. All right. That's the song for today. Uh, down here. Okay. So let's go to our next topic, which is protein purification. All right. Why do we want to purify proteins, okay? Biochemists are obsessed with purifying things, and the reason that they're obsessed with purifying things is it's much easier to study something alone than it is to study in a giant mixture. Much easier to do that. So biochemists spend a lot of time trying to get those things alone. That's the purification process, okay? So we want to get things alone. We want to get them purified away from everything else. And proteins are the most common things that we're trying to get alone, okay? Because proteins are the workhorses of the cell, as I've said before. Well, in order to purify proteins, we use some very cool tricks. Some of the tricks are based on structure that we've talked about. Some of the tricks are based on um, um, very cool technology, all right? Um, and I'm going to go through those with you. So let me just step you through the process that we go through in purifying proteins, okay? So let me come back to that. I don't want to do that right now. I'll come back to that. That's not a good place to start. Okay. So I want to purify a protein. And... Um, Proteins exist inside of cells, so I typically have a batch of cells. I might have um, an organ from an animal. I might have a, uh, a leaf from a plant. I might have a whole bunch of bacteria that I've grown up. Whatever it happens to be, I have a bunch of cells. The proteins are inside those cells, and I have to get the proteins out. So the first step in the process involves a rupturing. I have to do something to rupture the cells. This shows something called a downser, which you don't need to know the name of, but it's something that uh, basically squeezes the cells, excuse me, against the, the uh, glass tube, and that squeezing ruptures some of the cells. More commonly, people will use either a um, um, sonicator, sonic sound waves to physically break open the cells, or they may, um, uh, in some cases, um, my mind is escaping me at the moment. I'm having a senior moment up here. Uh, the uh, other things that they, they might do uh, would actually involve, um, as I said, sort of physical methods for, for breaking things apart. Okay? So these, as I say, can be sound waves. They can be other things that, that are there. Sometimes they take uh, very high pressures, and they'll put things at very high pressure and then release the pressure. And when they release the pressure, the uh, cells burst, okay, like a balloon or something. So anyway, the first step in the process is rupturing the cells because the contents of the cells are where the proteins are. Once we've done that, then there's a series of steps that we go through depending upon what we're trying to isolate. Okay? So we might have proteins, for example, stuck in the cell walls. If so, we'll be interested in the precipitate that comes when we spin this at a low RPM. Anything that's not in the cell walls will be stuck in the liquid layer if we take that liquid layer and we spin it at a higher rate of speed, we will knock down organelles, things like mitochondria, nuclei, and so forth. Okay? If so, if we're, what we're after is in the mitochondria or nuclei, we would take the pellet, that is the precipitate. Otherwise, we would take that liquid and we would spin it even further, where we would get rid of some of the smaller complexes like ribosomes, microsomes, etc. And 
if they're in the, in the pellet, we would take that. Otherwise, we would take the supernatant, which is where most of the proteins are that we're going to be interested in that are dissolved in the cytoplasm. Okay? So wherever we're after our proteins, we're going to take the appropriate fraction and then work with that fraction to isolate the proteins themselves. Okay? So we take these various isolates, we take whichever one we think our protein is in, and we go to the next step. Now the next step, there's no one way to do. We're going to see there's several approaches that people use to purify proteins. And a protein purification method will typically involve multiple steps. So there's no one way to purify every protein. Every protein that you work with takes some different consideration. So I'm going to show you some of the tools that we use then in separating those proteins out. The first one I think is kind of cool. Actually, I think they're all kind of cool. But the first one is particularly cool. It's called gel filtration. You also hear it called molecular exclusion. Okay? Gel filtration or molecular exclusion. All right? Now, I notice that sometimes students get confused when I use the word gel filtration. We'll talk about something called a gel later. This is not that kind of a gel. Okay? So it's called gel filtration. Probably not the best name. Well, let's talk about what this is first. So gel, with gel filtration, let's imagine I've got my stuff in that liquid layer. I've got the supernatant there. Okay? And I want to, I've got in that supernatant, I might have a few thousand proteins, and I want to try to separate those proteins on the basis of their size. That's what I'm going to do with gel filtration. I'm going to separate on the basis of their size. Okay? Well, to do this, I take uh, a column, which is what you see on the uh, screen there. And that column is just a hollow tube. And into that column, I pour some things that have porous gel beads in them. These are little tiny beads, about a millimeter or so in diameter. Maybe even a little bit bigger than that. Okay? But they're still fairly small beads. What's so special about these beads? What's special about these beads is that these little beads have tunnels in them. That is, they're not just a solid bead, but there's little holes bored through them. The little holes that are bored through them all have the same diameter. They all have the same diameter. So we can imagine a little tunnel, all of which is identical in width. Okay? Now, any given bead is going to have many of these, and we have many, many of the beads. So we have zillions of tunnels there. The tunnels are big enough that certain molecules can fit into them. All right? So we can imagine something that's a very tiny protein would fit into most of the tunnels, you know, it would fit into the tunnels very nicely. If we have a very big protein that's very wide, okay, very globular, it's very thick, it's, it's going to hit that bead and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit that tunnel. It's not going to be big, it's not going to be, um, the tunnel won't be big enough for it to get in. So it'll just bounce off. You with me? Okay. So if I take a mixture of proteins and I pour it on the top of this column, and I've got some buffer that's running through here. So the buffer is just to keep the protein stable. All right. What's going to happen is the proteins are going to separate on the basis of their size. And the reason is as follows. The littlest proteins are going to hit a tunnel. They're going to hit another tunnel, another tunnel, another tunnel, another tunnel. They're going to take a very long pathway getting through this column. The bigger proteins are not going to have that long pathway. They're going to hit a bead, they're going to bounce off, bounce off, bounce off, bounce off, and then they're out. They're not going to travel that whole distance of all those tunnels. So when I use gel exclusion chromatography, I can use different beads that have different size of holes, different size of tunnels, okay? And I can select which ones go in and enter the tunnels and which ones don't. So I can say, okay, I might have a gel exclusion column that has a molecular weight size of 50,000, meaning that most proteins over 50,000 in size will not enter the bead, whereas everything under 50,000 will enter the bead. Make sense? So what will happen is that when I run the column and I start over here on the left and I move to the right, I see more and more volume coming out the bottom. The first things that will come out are the largest molecules because they travel on the shortest pathway through the column. The slowest ones to come out will be the smaller molecules. 
So gel exclusion chromatography allows me to separate roughly, it's a, it's a fairly rough separation, but it allows me to separate roughly proteins based on their size. Yeah, that's a good question. How many different sizes would you usually be able to separate out? It's a fairly crude method. So you would probably do it something like what I said, something under 50,000 compared to everything over 50,000. So you would typically get, yeah, it would typically be like that. There, there's some things in the middle, but for the most part, it's a fairly, it's a fairly rough way of going at it. So the tunnels are all the same size? The tunnels are all the same size. They're all the same diameter for a given set of beads. So I might pick a different set of beads that's got an exclusion level of 10,000 or something. But you would mix beads? I would not mix beads, no. Okay, so the question was, if I, run this, if I run this experiment, is it time sensitive? Well, it's time sensitive in the sense that the, the, the buffer is flowing through at a fixed rate. So it is time sensitive because this is going to come out after a certain time or a certain volume, and this is going to come out at a different time or a different volume. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I would typically do if I did one of these columns was I would run it, and then I would run it for a real long time afterwards to flush everything out and make sure there wasn't something in there so I could go back and reuse the column. Okay. And these columns, people have done columns. I've, I've heard of people doing columns 30 feet high to really get some cool separations. And when they have big ones like that, they do get, tend to get more of a spectrum of sizes that come off of those. Okay, kind of cool. Here's um, another technology. It also, I'm sorry, that's not the one I want. Sorry. Another technology, I've got those in the wrong order. I'm getting bad about that. Another technology that uses beads, but instead of using beads with little tiny holes in them, it uses beads that have on their surface, <coughs> physically attached to them, molecules that can have charge. Okay? So I might have something on the surface of my bead that has negative charge. I might have something on the surface of my bead that has positive charge. Okay? Well, this is always confuses students, so I want you to be careful what I have to say here. The material that's there is negatively charged. When we start it out, it has to have a counter ion. And the counter ion is going to be positively charged. So if I had something like this, the counter ion would be a sodium. I'd have sodium attached out there to start with. When I add the, the buffer, the sodiums are going to kind of get, get washed away and be left with this negative charge. Does that make sense? The reason I say that is this process is called cation exchange. Cation exchange uses negative resins, negative molecules on that, those beads. But what's happening is the sodiums that were positively charged are exchanging and binding with proteins that are positively charged. Okay, So the positives are going to be attracted to the negatives. So the exchange is that a positively charged sodium is being exchanged with a positively charged protein. What if I have a negatively charged protein? It's not going to stick. It is not going to stick. It's going to come through. So if I'm doing cation exchange chromatography, the first things that are going to come through will be the negatively charged uh, proteins, probably followed by the zero charged proteins, and probably if I wait a long, long time, the positively charged proteins. Does that make sense? You might say, well, do, why do the positively charged proteins even come off? Well, these are not covalent bonds. So again, these are a matter of holding on tight, but we let things run long enough, they will come off. We can use some cool tricks to get them off. We can actually add a whole bunch of salt, a whole bunch of sodium. We put enough sodium on there we start helping the protein to come off because the sodium now starts exchanging in the other direction, getting the protein off. We could do the other. We could have an anion exchange uh, uh, separation. Okay? In an anion exchange separation, we would have a uh, resin that's attached to the bead that has a positive charge. In this case, the counter ion would be a chloride, which would be negatively charged. Anion exchange chromatography would bind to negatively charged proteins. And the positively charged proteins would come off first, the zero charged next, 
and finally the uh, negatively charged proteins at the very end. Okay, kind of cool stuff. Okay, the overall process is called ion exchange chromatography. So this sort of shows uh, an illustration of cation exchange chromatography. Okay, I drew this myself. So if you guys are awed by all the artistic nature of this one, then you can just you know say something. I don't know. Yeah. How do I separate the what? How do you separate the protein from, from the cations or anions chilix? How do I separate it from the, 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 the beads? You, you just purify the proteins using okay. them. But how do you separate this charge from the proteins? From this, this compound from the proteins? I'm not sure I understand. So these guys are, these guys are attached to the beads. They don't come through. The protein will let go of that, and they'll, they'll eventually come through. So they're not attached to the beads physically. They're just attracted to them. Oh. Make sense? By wash, can I take the protein? By washing, you can get your protein off. That's right. OK? OK, so this depicts what happens. There's the bead. There's the, the red guy is the negatively charged stuff. There's the counter ions, the sodiums. OK? We mix in a solution that has positively charged, negatively charged, and zero charge we can see that the positively charged proteins are attracted. The other ones aren't attracted. They pass through the system. And at the, end, at the end of the very first step of the process, we've separated the positives away from everybody else. OK? That's a very cool thing for us to do. How might I change the charge on a protein? Could I use some tricks to help purify my protein? How would I change the charge of my protein? What's that? change the pH of the solution, right? I start putting protons in there, I'm going to change the pH of the solution. There are some problems that I've assigned that you should look at where you um, uh, figure out the charge of a protein. You should, know, you should know how to predict how to do that, okay? And I'll say a little bit more about that later, okay? And by the way, a couple people have asked me, do I have practice exams? I'm gonna put a practice exam up tonight uh, for the first exam. So you'll have something to see the types of questions that I ask, and more importantly, the format. I strongly urge people not to study old exams. They spend too much time looking at old exams and wasting their time on things that sometimes we haven't talked about. Okay? So it's more important to study the material than it is to study old exams. But I will give you an old exam so you'll see the format of my exams. Okay? And that'll give you some, some thoughts as well. Okay. Cation exchange chromatography. All right. This physically shows the overall process happening. So here we have uh, some... Um, uh, proteins that are in this case are, uh, in this case, I think we've got anion exchange. Uh, is that right? No, we've got cation exchange chromatography. Okay, so we've got proteins. We see sticking of the positives to the thing. We see the negatives coming through. And then that doesn't show up very well at all, does it? There's the negatives coming through right there. Yeah. Okay. I didn't draw that one, so. All right. Now, there's another type of um, chromatography that is used called affinity. And affinity is pretty cool, all right? So the first two things that I've shown you are fairly, uh, what I would call crude. We can get big and small, but we can't get some real specific things. We can get positive and negative, but we can't get some real specific things, okay? This technology I'm getting ready to describe to you gives us some very nice specific things, okay? This technology is called affinity chromatography. Affinity chromatography uses some characteristics of the specific protein that we're after as a tool for isolating it. How does it work? Okay. Well, let's say that I'm doing some research and I know the protein that I want to purify <clears throat> binds to ATP. I know it binds to ATP. Okay. That's the only thing I know about it, but I know it binds to ATP. Is there something I can do, I can use of that information to isolate my protein? And it turns out there is. I can make my own resin. And instead of putting negatively charged or positively charged things on there, what if I put ATP onto those little beads? I can make little beads that have thousands of ATPs sticking out off of them. The ATP is physically attached to the bead, so it's not going anywhere. I take my mixture of proteins and I pour it across the top of that. And when I pour it across the top, any proteins that bind to ATP are going to bind to the column 
And any proteins that don't bind to ATP are going to come through first. Okay? How do I get my proteins off of the column? Well, I just add a whole bunch of ATP. Because when I add ATP, whenever a protein lets go for a moment, it grabs a hold of an ATP, and now it's not bound to the column anymore, and it comes out. This is a very cool technology. It allows me to be much more specific in the types of proteins that I'm isolating. I can use this for anything that a protein binds to. Very, very nice way to isolate proteins based on something that we know about them. Questions about that? OK. All right. Um, I'm going to jump ahead and talk about a couple of technologies here, and then I'll finish for the day. So how many people in here have done electrophoresis? OK. So electrophoresis is a technology that uses gels. There's that word again. Okay. And gels are um, basically materials that are what I like to describe as uh, fibrous. They have basically, they're basically a support for water. They're called gels because they have a gelatinous uh, uh, appearance. They are not unlike jello in terms of their sort of physical characteristics. But what they have actually, this is a picture of an agarose gel. Agarose is a uh, polysaccharide that when I dissolve it in water and heat it up, it does like jello does, okay? When it cools down, it'll, it'll solidify. Well, different from Jell-O, what the gels that I'm using, the agarose that I'm using here has, is agarose makes a sort of a web within there. It's a support. So that web has holes in it. And in the holes, water is sitting. Buffer can sit in there. I can make a gel uh, with buffer, which is what I would very commonly do. Well, those holes are big enough that biomolecules can sort of get through them. I'm going to talk first about DNA. I haven't been talking about DNA, but I'm going to talk about DNA because it's the easiest to understand. DNA is negatively charged. It's also a long rod. Okay? With an agarose gel, I can put at the very head of it, right here, you see that little blue color right there? What they've done is that little blue color is an indicator where they've put their DNA at the very end of the gel in what's called a well. It's just a little chamber to put the DNA into. If they then take and attach this to what's called a power supply and apply an electrical field against it, they put negatively charged, they put the negative electrode down here, they put the positive electrode down here. DNA being negatively charged will be repelled by this electrode and it will be attracted by this electrode. DNA will go racing through here. And the speed with which it goes through will be a function of its size. The smallest ones will be the fastest because they are the easiest to navigate through that little web of material. The smallest guys go, go fastest, the largest guys go slowest. When I do that, I get something that looks like this. This shows the separation of DNA fragments by an agarose gel. Okay? And we can see that things that have specific sizes will navigate to specific places on the gel. Okay? The smallest guys down here, this will be the very smallest one, the very largest ones up here. Make sense? <clears throat> when I go to isolate proteins, I've got a little different situation. Because DNA is all negatively charged, protein is not all negatively charged. Okay? So I use this trick with DNA, but if I'm going to use the same trick with proteins, I've got to do something to make it at least look all negatively charged. Okay? To do that, I use a very cool trick. So I've got to explain the trick to you. First of all, we do proteins with something called uh, a, uh, instead of using agarose, we use something called acrylamide. And acrylamide makes a web just like agarose does, except for the holes are much smaller, because you remember proteins are much smaller than DNA is. Okay? So I use acrylamide gels to separate 
proteins. Acrylamide gels to separate proteins. This just shows the chemical structure, which you don't need to know. But you can see there's a, there's a little part of the web, there's a little part of the web, there's a little part of the web that's there. Okay? So smaller molecules are being separated by uh, an acrylamide gel. Well, it's not just the size that's important, but it's also the charge. So I need to describe that to you. Okay? Proteins have, as I said, a, uh, a variety of charges. What I would like to have would be a relatively uniform negative charge, and I would like it to be rod-shaped, kind of like the DNA was. Remember, DNA was a linear rod-shaped molecule. Proteins tend to be all folded up. Most of, the, most of the proteins are globular. They're all folded up, and they're not rod-shaped. So I need to do some alteration to the proteins in order to separate them by gel electrophoresis. And the trick is very cool. What we do is we take those proteins, the mixture of proteins, and we treat it with a detergent called SDS. I'll give you the name, but you don't need to know it. Sodium dodecyl sulfate. SDS, you do need to know. Okay? We treat it with a detergent. Detergents, as I mentioned the other day, the reason we wash our hands with soap is because detergent, soaps, and so forth will denature proteins. That's the first step. What SDS will do is it'll take that folded up structure and it'll basically lay it out in linear rod-like form. The second thing that the SDS will do is it turns out it will coat that protein. It will actually basically encapsulate that protein by, taking, by, by wrapping it all up with these individual molecules, thousands of molecules of SDS. Well, SDS has a negative charge. Has a negative charge. What I have just done is what I had hoped to do, which is to make a rod that's uniformly negative in charge, just like my DNA molecule was. Okay? I can now take and apply that protein to the top of a gel, just like I did with the DNA, put the negative electrode on top, put the positive electrode on the bottom, and what will happen is they will separate on the basis of their size. The smallest ones will go first, the largest ones will go last. And I will get things that look very much like what we saw with the um, uh, agarose. Okay? We'll get bands corresponding to specific molecular weights of protein. Does that work with negatively charged proteins? That works with both negatively charged and positively charged proteins. Because there's, that's right, it doesn't repel. It's a good question. But what happens is that the nonpolar side of it is what attaches or basically associates with the protein. And so the negatives all point outwards. It's kind of a cool technology. The other thing people say was, well, if you had some positive charges there, doesn't that change the overall charge? Very, very slightly. Most proteins, if they're positively charged, have a handful of positive charges, four or five or six. Okay? And we're talking about thousands of negatives that are on there with the wrapping of the SDS. Okay, I see people are restless to leave. Um, I've got a very cool thing to start with tomorrow, so I'll leave you with that, or not tomorrow, Friday, and uh, we'll go with that, okay? Unless you wanna come back tomorrow. <laughs>